following interview <clears throat> was conducted with um, Gerald D. Jeffs, Professor Emeritus of Veterinary Physiology and Pharmacology and Director Emeritus of Research for the Animal Housing and Care for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, August 7, 2009, Stewart Center. The interviewer was Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Good afternoon, Dr. Gibbs, and thank you very much. Thank you. Um, tell us a little bit about where you were born and your siblings in early years. Okay. I was born in Colby, Kansas, which is near the Colorado line, uh, in 1923, which makes me 66 years old. Uh, I, uh, we moved to eastern Kansas when I was about three years old, so I really uh, grew up on the eastern part of Kansas. A town called Sabetha. I uh, went through. Well, we moved to St. Joe for a while, and then we came back to Sabetha. And uh, I went through uh, high school at Sabetha, Kansas. Uh, <clears throat> what was high school like? Any it was. It was. Uh, it was an interesting part of my life. I was a very shy guy, so I didn't get into social social affairs very much. But uh, we had. Uh, I was president of the FFA uh, organization. I was also vice president of the class a couple of times. And was it a, what was the size of your class? It was. A, it was about uh, seventy students in each class. And there was, was it four years? Four in years. High okay. Yes. Uh, we um, enlarged rather suddenly in the uh, in the 1930s because they started uh, busing students in with buses. They had, up till then, they didn't have buses. School buses. School buses. And um, also, the uh, the church, which we called the Mennonite Church, began to, to liberalize their views on higher education, and we had quite an inflow of students from that group from 20 on down to 12 or 15 <laughs> years of age. Uh, during, uh, during those years, I played basketball, played football, loved to play baseball. Uh, then I got a scholarship to go to Kansas State University from Sears. In, How did that come about? Did you apply for it? Well, uh, they give 15 in the state, and my, one of my teachers included my resume uh, for this organization, for these uh, awards, and, uh, and I received, at that point, only $150, but I would never have gone to college if it hadn't been for that, because my folks were very poor. We lived on a very, very bad farm. <laughs> And uh, that bought my books and uh, paid my tuition. In, in did, you, did you live on campus? I lived uh, in a uh, kind of a co-op house. Okay. We right. called it the Sears house. I, I joined a fraternity rather early, about two second year into my school in, in, at Kansas State. Uh, well, uh, more notably, in my freshman year, I was elected secretary treasurer of the freshman class at Kansas State, which I thought was kind of interesting. Nobody knew me, but I got it. Then I joined the fraternity the next year and uh, Alpha Gamma Rho fraternity and uh, waited tables there in order to stay there. Then the um, I applied for, decided to go to veterinary school after the end of my first year in ag school and uh, I was admitted then after my second year in school. And uh, fortunate for me, uh, I was, uh, the Army came by and uh, in order for us to continue in school, they actually we all enlisted the whole school. And we became a part of what was called the ASTP program in which we uh, lived in barracks and went to class regularly. Did you have to wear a uniform? Yes, we all had uniforms. We were in the regular army. I've had all the privileges of having been a veteran in the war. 
but I never really got through school before the war terminated, or it was nearly so. So I never did go into any other duty. Most of my class members, however, were ultimately called into the Veterinary Corps in the Army. But, uh, what was the Veterinary Corps? What, what did that be comprised of? Well, they were, they were... What were their duties? Or their duties primarily were meat and food inspection. All, all the food that was served on any of the Army camps or Navy camps or Air Corps had to have been inspected by veterinarians, okay. including uh, primarily animal products, but uh, also other products too, I think. And uh, some of them, um, I, I don't know, some of them, I guess, were with the Army in Europe, earlier ones, and they were serving over there. Our class, I think, very few of them ever got out of the States. I graduated in 45, which you realize was the day, was the end of the war. Uh, and I went to work for the state of Illinois. What was the job market after the war? What? It was very good for veterinarians. There was a very s serious shortage of veterinarians in practice at that time. Many states, uh, there were only 12 schools when I went through. And that's primarily the reason why so many of them started after the war. But uh, there was no no shortage of jobs. We could, uh, oh, we had a lot of choices. Many of them went into practice, but uh, some of us went to uh, work for different states in their program. I went to Illinois and worked for them for one year in testing cattle for tuberculosis and Bangs disease. This was with the state, the state the position? state position, yes. Okay. And uh, at that end of that year, I decided to uh, join a fellow in practice up in Kankakee, Illinois. And uh, I stayed with him for two years. What kind of practice was that, large or small? It was primarily large animals, but we built a cat and dog hospital. There were only four veterinarians in that whole region at that point. There must be 25 up there now. but. Uh, we built a cat and dog hospital, but we really spent most of our time out. There was a, it was a uh, cow area. <laughs> they called it the Chicago Milk Shed up there at that time. So I worked there for two years, and in the process, while I was there, I got married to a Kankakee gal. And that uh, kind of life really didn't appeal to me because I was out very late at night, usually doing veterinary work, and as I said, I didn't get dinner until nine o'clock the whole last month I was there. So I had a chance to go to the University of Missouri, take over a, a beginning class there in, in physiology. I had had no special training, but they needed a veterinarian to take over this class. And uh, I started teaching the freshman class at Missouri when they actually were halfway through the, that particular subject. So I had kind of a problem catching up with them. Uh, most of them were veterans older than me and uh, they were very patient and uh, <laughs> it was quite a nice experience. Then I had a chance to uh, get a much better paying job at the uh, Oklahoma State University who also were just starting a, a class in, vet, in, vet, in vet school, in vet school. Mm -hmm. the Missouri one and the and the and the Oklahoma one were one of about ten maybe that started right after the war. Most of the states began to realize they needed a veterinary school, except Purdue didn't start at that point. Although there was great agitation for one by uh, particularly the farm groups in Indiana. But at any rate, they didn't start one then until 59. But in, in about 1950, there must have been a, at least eight or 10 new schools started. Well, I went then to Oklahoma State for four years. And uh, Dean Hutchings, who was, they had, they had a very nice graduate program here at Purdue, not a veterinary school, but in 52, uh, 
together he and I decided that he wanted to start some physiology research here at Purdue in the physiology in the veterinary science department. Now he was the, de the head of the department in the ag school, Dean Dr. Hutch. Veterinary science. Yes. Okay. That uh, particular department ex existed for many years, actually, before the vet school started. And he decided that uh, I should, or we decided that I should, could come here and do graduate work in veterinary physiology, although there were no physiologists on the staff in the vet science department. But I, and I went ahead and got my degree in uh, 1957, my PhD. Uh, during that period, I taught a, a number of couple of courses to ag students, although I was a graduate student myself, but uh, animal physiology and animal anatomy I taught. And uh, Let me ask you this, what were the students when they graduated with the veterinary science, what were what, what the, We physician? didn't really have any students in our department okay. other than service students, okay. like students that come from other departments, okay. Pri primarily animal science. In dairy science. Okay, okay. Um, during uh, during this period, uh, Purdue was very active in research. That was our forte here. And one of the reasons there was no school probably started any sooner than it was, uh, the active research that was going on here was so important throughout the country that between Purdue and Wisconsin, these two states sort of decided to be research-oriented uh, veterinary science departments. So there was no veterinary school started immediately. But uh, the Farm Bureau and other ag groups very strongly, and, and Dr. Hovde, and to some extent Dean Hutchings, or who's then just head of the department, uh, pushed the, the thing along and during the f five years or so that I was here before it started, I think it went through, there were bills introduced into the legislature every two years to start the school. And uh, there was quite a political fight over whether we really wanted one. The staff that were here didn't support one and they didn't oppose it. They were sort of left up to the powers that be. I think Dr. Hutchings favored having one. He was the head of the department. But Hubdy was very strongly oriented to having one because all the other state schools in this area now had veterinary schools. And uh, it was his uh, opinion that Purdue should have one. But the Farm Bureau, I think they had strong uh, influence in the state legislature at that time. Well, the swine breeders and the uh, animal groups, even small animal people and poultry people, uh, began to push for it rather strongly in the legislature. And uh, so there was a, a $2 million grant given to uh, start the school uh, very late at night after midnight even, I think. In fact, a lot of them got up the next morning and the legislators said, I didn't know we voted in a veterinary school. But wow. it, it was kind of the way things were done in those days, I think. But anyway, they pr provided $2 million that first appropriation. And we took the $2 million. At this point, I was uh, had finished my PhD. And Dean Hutchings, asked me to sort of be the carrier of the news between the architect and the, and the staff. You know, anything that they wanted to know over there, I was to come over and ask somebody. Well, it turned out nobody really had any care, you know, and so I became a, <laughs> I became it. Because Hutchings got sick and died rather soon thereafter. And uh, he was my principal help uh, uh, coordinator on the thing. But I, I took that job in, in about four years, three years, I guess, before the whole thing was planned. And, and then two years later, after the first appropriation, they gave us about two and a half million 
or was it three and a half million more? <laughs> Some big sum. They asked us how much more we needed to finish the job. And uh, by this time we had made plans and everything and knew, and had equipment lists made up and everything. And so we knew about what it cost. And I will say that this school was the only one that was ever built completely with a, a pre-knowledge of what it was going to cost and got the money ahead of time. Hutchings insisted on doing this, and uh, it was well done. All the other schools I know it took several years to get them finished, and, and they... We, needed a, we got it up front. We got it up front. And I'm also proud of the fact that this school, the physical facilities here, have outlasted by far those of any other school that started in that particular they've all rebuilt they built out further out in the country or totally changed things and greatly expanded or something but just up until a few years ago we had really done hardly anything to this school which was built in 59 so now there have been additions added on it and I keep saying they're ruining my building but <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting. Now, what else do I not have uh, included? Uh, then um, your initial res let's go to the, the um, when you st first got well, after the first classes you were doing some teaching. But then in '67, you became the head of veterinary physiology and pharmacology. Let's talk a little bit about that. Well, it would have been '59. Oh, was it '59? Okay. Dean Hutchings. Dean Hutchings appointed the four department heads. Uh, very, very early after the money was provided okay. in the planning because he wanted us to be the planners of the departments. There was a department of anatomy, okay. uh, a department of physiology and pharmacology, a department of microbiology, pathology, and public health, and veterinary clinics and he named the department heads at that point too. Okay. And uh, I was the physiology department head. Mm -hmm. uh, how would you go about recruiting the students? To, how did that uh, get, how would you get the first class? Well, it became uh, known in Indiana at least mm -hmm. that we were starting a school and uh, we got applications uh, now the first class, let's see, I believe there was no more than 40 in that class. Something I read, the first graduating class had about 44 students in 63. Yes, okay, that okay. was the first class. And mm -hmm. they, uh, we began to set up committees within the school and we had an admissions committee uh, established and uh, they interviewed uh, applicants. And I would say in that first group, first year group they probably took fairly much everyone who had the qualifications grade wise otherwise not being crit critical <laughs> but I know that we had uh, we had a good class the first class I still admire a bunch of those guys because mm -hmm. they mostly were veterans and they knew what they wanted and right. That happened for several years, really. The veterans were the ones that got in the classes. But uh, I, I think that we took a very, very few out-of-state students in that first class. We took, there was quite a backlog of people who had been wanting in, but maybe hadn't got quite enough quali qualification courses. Uh, but eventually then it uh, grew the next year, I think, to 60-some students. Mm -hmm. We planned the building throughout to be for 65 students. Now it's grown beyond that now, sure. but... Uh, Did your planning also include some a graduate program in, in the early days? Well, we already had fairly okay. active graduate program. Okay, in partly fact, because of the veterinary science? Yes, from... Dr. Hutchings, in his period of time here, he came here in the oh, in the middle '40s somewhere, and uh, he became head of the department. I think about '47, maybe '48, 
his desire was to really build the graduate program. And when I came in 52, I think, I think there were five or six of us all came in that one particular year. In fact, Claflin, Halterman, and I all came together. So uh, the graduate program was expanded, and uh, of course, with the four, four new okay. departments, we had quite an influx in anatomy and uh, physiology. What about faculty recruitment? How did you, you were involved in that, of course, for your department? Yes, uh, we had problems with that, and I uh, still do. <laughs> we have very few veterinarians uh, teaching in the basic sciences anymore. Uh, veterinarians, uh, the ones that, would, of course, we preferred to get those with graduate degrees to teach the sure. basic sciences, as they do in all three of the lower departments. Uh, my experience as head of the physiology department, uh, well, it, it was easier really in a way to get veterinarians at that point than it is now. Because I don't know that we have any veterinarians in, of recent vintage in any of the lower departments at this okay. point. Okay. Many of them are uh, graduates of other schools and departments, but uh, and some of them are foreign mm -hmm. instructors. What about curriculum? How did you, uh, did you get a view? A curriculum committee, of course, was key. Yeah, we had a committee, a cr curriculum committee uh, assigned very quickly, and uh, we had a lot of co other schools to copy off of. <laughs> Each, a lot of us were from different schools, you know. I was from Kansas State. So we, uh, we pretty much used our own experience, and I had been at El Oklahoma, and I'd been at uh, Missouri, and uh, and you saw what the need was and what you needed to. Yes, in those together. days we had very little interest in small animal practice. That that was not what they wanted. Sure. <laughs> the farm groups wanted veterinary, the large, large large animal people, and uh, they were a little uh, put out at us for putting as much emphasis in our building program as we did for small animal medicine. There's been a lot of criticism that we didn't put near enough in, but. At that point in time, <laughs> I got about all that, that that would pass judgment with the large groups. In fact, we didn't really, really fulfill our obligation to the poultry people. They wanted more research a activity in the poultry diseases. And uh, we didn't give them much in the way of special quarters like we did swine maybe and the virus. But they were, there was a great carryover there, like virus research that went on across the whole board, and pathology was pretty much covered, oh, yeah. chickens too, and, sure. and the diagnostic lab was very active in those days in, yeah, yeah. in that area of chicken diseases so, and swine diseases. Sure, right. So it, it, uh, it, were, it was kind of a, a, a bit of a problem to get the small animal unit built up enough. Right. We did have outside consultants. I had uh, uh, two or three people from Cornell who came to help us plan the, the clinic areas. And uh, You didn't have a, what's known today as the teaching hospital, did you, in those days? Well, did it you? was all built at the same time. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. And of course you had the big dedication of yes. the building in 1960. Yes, mm -hmm. the whole building was completed. Right. We even had uh, three or four out, fairly sizable outbuildings. The virus isolation unit was uh, finished. We redid the whole animal disease uh, diagnostic uh, post-mortem area. That's been re that's been expanded way down there now. It's a big, big valley now. <laughs> At the time, the ADDL was pretty pretty small so uh, well we decided uh, pretty much with the the university a, a, a gentleman by the name of Henry Abbott you maybe never heard of him he was R.B. Stewart's I guess you call him right-hand man 
and he was an elderly fellow, but he and I, uh, he, he would tell me what we could have and what we couldn't have. He was a contact, right? Yeah, and of course, uh, Blakesley, he, he decided what we could do in the way of class sizes, in terms of room sizes. Uh, the gentleman that you talked about, the, the librarian, uh, Oh, Oliver Dunn. Oliver Dunn. He uh, he sort of he designed the library for us, and uh, to a great extent. And uh, oh, we had an interior decorator who told us what kind of uh, office furniture we could get, uh, and that was. Uh, and he also designed really the library furniture. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I can't remember. He went to down to Missouri to a university down there. Uh, because you didn't have a library before they came with the building. Well, we had a very, very small one sure. in the old vet science building. Okay. Just, a, just a room. We just had books in there. Then, Ann Kirker, he hired Ann very early. And Ann really had a lot to do with how that library right. developed. Yeah. Right. She was very good at that. And she, she had enough uh, smartness to know what us veterinarians were up to, you know. And, uh, she was very cooperative, very knowledgeable. Uh, Ann was a neat, neat person. Uh, what about the oh, about your research? What's that? Uh, your direct, your director emeritus of research, animal housing and care. Uh, yeah, after I I was the department head up until 1979. Okay. That would have been 20, 23 years or so. Uh, I took a sabbatical, and in the process, I decided to uh, give up the position of head of the department. So I just became a full professor again, where teaching and research. And uh, unfortunately, the, the people down in the laboratory animal area, <laughs> Harry Stoliker, he passed away during this period in the 80s, and uh, they had some conflicts with the we were in charge of all of the laboratory animals on, on the whole campus by by I'm saying in, involved with we were kind of the inspection to see that they were cared for correctly and met the ideals of the <laughs> humane societies and, and we also helped with if they had diseases that broke out in these animals and birds so I took over that job down there uh, with the animal units throughout the university and I met with the different departments in the university and I was called quite frequently. To <laughs> and the, and down here we had a lot of research animals, of course, down here in these old, we had a lot of, of uh, oh, sheep and pigs and dogs and cats and mice and rats and guinea pigs and mink and so I just sort of handled the people who did the work down there the cleaner uppers and sure. I hired the staff and hired the staff down there yes right. okay and I had that job until I retired in uh, 80 but in, you continued with your teaching though didn't you or well not? I had three offices <laughs> I had one up here yes I did I taught I taught, uh, taught physiology some, and I taught a course in toxicology, which was one of our advanced courses. Mm -hmm. did, you, uh, were you, did you advise some grad students, of course? At that point, no. I, okay. I really didn't have graduate students. Okay. I was always very proud of my graduate students. Dr. Teets, one of my first ones, and Dr. Hughes, and Dr. Curtin. Dr. Teets eventually became president of, of uh, Montana State University. He was dean of a school for a while and became president out of Montana State. In fact, they in hired, uh, they in interviewed him for the job when uh, uh, Beering, when Beering was made the president, Teets had been on their number two list. <laughs> Uh, well, Dr. Curtin became uh, dean of the veterinary school in North Carolina State. 
Uh, and Dr. Well, uh, Dr. Hughes was only in pharmacology, I guess. But uh, a lot of the graduate students in our in our school went on the sure. whole school went on to sure. very nice job yeah. positions. Um, now that's how I happened to get that job. The guy down there died. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for researchers, what were the federal capitation grant funds? Okay, I believe it was in the early 70s or late 60s, probably early 70s, 70s sometime, that the federal government uh, came up with the idea of uh, increasing the number of veterinarians by going through a program in which they provided capitation funds to enlarge the size of your facilities. Now, I think you had to increase your class size by 10% or maybe even more. It's been a while. Anyway, we uh, we applied for and were given capitation funds. What were they to be used for? To, to uh, increase, uh, make it possible to increase class size. And okay. I suppose what it meant was we, we would use it for staff people. Okay. Okay. We could use it for physical facilities. Sure. In fact, the basement over in that building was unfinished pretty much. And we- and This is Lynn Hall? Lynn Hall. That was one of my one of my good achievements was I talked the architect into putting a unfinished basement in there. He says, "Oh, you guys always want unfinished basements." He said, "Why do you do that?" We to need me? space. So he said to raise the whole building two feet in order to provide what he thought was adequate space. For well, anyway, we we probably used it for that. Uh, uh, um, Could you use it for uh, recruitment of uh, faculty? Yeah, staff? I think, yeah, I think we okay. did. Mm -hmm. Sure. sure. Okay. So it was a very nice. It was. A, it was a. a it was a good a program. Nice right. Very yeah. good program. Would this have been on? Did you have to apply for it on an annual basis, or? You know, I think once they provided that, they figured the states ought to put in that that money the next year. I think. Okay. Because I don't think we got it over. Uh, uh, any length of period. Okay, okay. I couldn't, uh, I shouldn't say because I don't know. Sort of a teaser to get going, right? <laughs> I think it was kind of, you know, they de the, the federal <laughs> government keeps doing that to the states. They provide this program and then the state is stuck with it. <laughs> Set up funds or something like that. Oh, right. right. <laughs> yeah. And of course, during your time, the school, and this was under Dr. Stockton, that changed from veterinary science and medicine to the School of Veterinary Medicine. Yes. That was not totally agreed uh, as a being appropriate, but uh, see, that was one of Dr. Hovde's main thoughts. He says, I want it to be, he and Dr. Hutchings together, he says, I would like to maintain that as a science school as well. Okay. So that was why. That's how the name came about in the beginning. Really beginning, right. And uh, Stockton thought it was a little bit. Oh, maybe lengthy, <laughs> but he was quite adamant that it, we take out that science part. I don't know why it meant so much to Stockton to do that. But well, he finally got the name changed then, right? Yes, yeah. he did. Right. Uh, some of the deans now, Dr. Hutchins, and then after him was Dr. Morse. Right? Dr. Morse. Okay. And uh, I, can I turn this off? Sure. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, after the, the uh, next one would have been Jack Stockton. Jack Stockton uh, mm -hmm. was uh, was associate dean, I believe, for maybe three or four years before uh, he became dean. Erskine Morris was uh, uh, resigned his position about uh, ten years into his. He was gone for a while, and then he came back and was dean for a number of years. Jack Stockton. Uh, was then dean, I would say, until Hugh Lewis came in. Gosh, I don't recall. Mm -hmm. Okay, but he was the next. And, uh, Hugh Lewis was uh, here in only a short term. What was that name? Hugh Lewis. Hugh Lewis, right? Okay. Right. He was he was dean not uh, very long, maybe two or three years, and then he joined the uh, uh, company that puts out pet food. And drugs and stuff for pets. And Alan Rebar then was one of our former students who graduated with us, got his PhD here, was made associate dean, Hugh, or, uh, I believe he was a, 
worked with Stockton first and then with Hugh Lewis and then he became dean. And he was in uh, veterinary pathology, I think, before he became dean too. And then uh, uh, Willie Reed was made dean after. Mm -hmm. Alan was made uh, head of the research park, I believe. Right, right. And uh, Willie Reed is current dean. Very good. Mm -hmm. And he was had been here before. He was. A he was a graduate student right. here right. before. I right. don't believe he went through school here, but I think he was a graduate student. Got mm -hmm. his PhD anyway here. Right. Yeah. Then you've had some anniversaries. We were here for the 25th and the 50th. I'll yes, like uh -huh. mm -hmm. yeah. I have modeled for the 25th one. <laughs> yes, and uh, I don't recall that celebration hardly, though. No. Um, one thing they did, they had that medal that they crafted. Yeah, the, I, have the, I have a copy of the medal. Right. In fact, I think I have two of them. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember whether we had a big celebration or not. Oh, well, there were some things. There was also some lectures, and people came and things. Oh, of that. yeah, some that's what lecture it was. Series. Mm -hmm. right, lecture exactly. series, right? And you have a banquet, or you know, there are some things. Yeah, like, and yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. that um, medal that they crafted, you know, which is really nice. Very really nice, right? right. Yes, yeah, really is. Uh, one thing about the IU uh, School of Medicine at Lafayette, your people from your department were teaching there. Uh, yes. For the researchers, I wanted to yes. have you make a comment on that. Well, that program was spread all over campus, you know. Sure. Uh, and the physiology was, uh, let's see, I, I believe it was headquartered in the microbiology department over in the School of Science. Although Dr. Tacker, who taught that eventually, was also a member of both departments, so we were kind of involved. We, I believe, taught the pharmacology, although I can't say for sure, sure. because that was kind of in a, the people that taught it, including Dr. Kopic, I think, were in both, both departments, both schools. and. Uh, we didn't, the, those people that were involved with that medical program, those people pretty much are all over in biological engineering, bioengineering. Although they have part-time appointments in the physiology department. In the I vet school. In the vet school. Okay. But I don't believe they ever have had graduate students in the vet school that were in that sure. department. I'm probably wrong on that, but I can't think of any. Right. Okay. And of course, it's still going. It's going very. Right. Dr. Geddes has been ahead of that, and he's now retired. But he's right. quite a quite a organizer. Oh. All right. Yeah. Um, the awards and honors. Can you make any some comments on some awards or something special comes to mind? I really can't hardly remember anything that was very special. Okay. Um, Any teaching ones that you got over time? Probably got some of those. Can't even remember those here. Did oh. Missouri? Did it Oklahoma? Well, that's all right. That's kind of good. <laughs> what about to your professional associations? Where what was your involvement with any of those? I those? was in the uh, AVMA Indiana, and the Indiana one. One in Indiana right. and Northwest Indiana has a organization. On the in the AVMA, uh, in the National AVMA, American Veterinarian. I was on a council there for eight years on drugs and biological agents. Uh, I was also uh, president of the American Association of Veterinary Physiologists and Pharmacologists for two terms, I believe. Uh, I was on the uh, Kansas State basketball team. That sounds good to me. <laughs> How'd the team do? <laughs> well, you're tall enough; you could get some of those yeah, baskets well, in there. Yeah, well, not too good. We we we. This was in the late part of the war and early after the war, and eventually they turned into a very good team. But our team wasn't too good. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, uh, most of the team members were veterinary <laughs> students because we were the only. It runs around, right? Only ones around. <laughs> 
And let's see, what else happened? <laughs> I was a member of Sigma Xi and okay. uh, Alpha Zeta and of course a lot of them. And of I course was, you participated in the annual uh, veterinary medical meeting that's held here. Yes, the, I gave talks to that sure, right. a few times. And that's an ongoing, long-going thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. Let's talk a little about family. Do you, uh, or do you, you when you came I, here, where'd you meet your wife? At Kankakee, Illinois. Okay. And when I was in a practice up there, and we, uh, she died five, six years ago now, and uh, we celebrated our 55th anniversary, I think, before she died. Okay. <laughs> Have three daughters. Or did they come to Purdue? Uh, one of them did, one of them went to IU, and one of them went to Butler. Oh, okay. <laughs> Kept in Indiana. <laughs> yeah. The two older ones, I thought they ought to branch out a little bit, so I I urged them to go to other schools, and the, Liam went, the oldest one went to IU. Okay. Met, a, met her present husband, and he's an MD, and they live in Orlando, Florida. He, uh, he has a practice in a hospital in the villages. Have you ever heard of that? It's mm -hmm. near, near Orlando. Uh, my second one, uh, her husband is uh, was uh, CEO in the uh, Citizens Gas in Indianapolis. <laughs> He's now retired. My younger one uh, married a local fella, uh, a Seeger. Tom Seeger, and uh, they live in uh, near Lake Zurich, Illinois. Okay. You have any grandchildren as well? I have seven grandchildren. Okay. No yeah. grandchildren. No great grandchildren. Oh well, that's coming next. <laughs> <laughs> I had a daughter got married. Granddaughter got married just a month ago. This is really way out there, but uh, one of the one of her good friends was Molly, who was the girl that the bachelor chose on television. Molly, something, I don't know whether you remember the story, he chose the other girl first and then he decided he wanted to go back with Molly and the next week and it got to be quite a hassle there, but she was at the wedding, I got to meet Molly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, let's talk, how about the, the retirement activities? What have you been involved? I have uh, been uh, very active in bowling and golf. And uh, I worked at the golf course for eight, seven years, I what guess. What golf course do you work? Is this at the Purdue course. Okay. I was a starter there and ranger at times. Uh, I won the state veterinary golf tournament once <laughs> back in the 70s. That We have a veterinary, annual veterinary golf tournament. I won that one year. Uh, I, go, I play in the staff league yet in golf play whenever I can. Bowl in five leagues, <laughs> so I bowl four or five times a week, starting right now, really. Yeah, right. the seat, they let up a little bit in the summer, I imagine. Yeah, they, they did. I only bowl three, bowl three here, times. Do you, you bowl here at Purdue? Or? We bowl at, uh, no, the other lanes, actually, the Purdue, the one here. We never have bowled in this, not while I bowl with them, in the Union building, because they're bigger leagues than they have. Sure, exactly. And uh, yes, I have been was chairman of the bowling league once, <laughs> the uh, Purdue Bowling League. Okay. Do you participate? Are you do you participate in the Purdue Retirement Association? Have you gone to any of their events? Uh, let me think. What do I do with those? Well, I go, we have a meeting every week, a group of us from the vet school, you know. Okay. Every Wednesday we have lunch. You ought to come over and join us sometime. Oh, I'll have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> come. Every Wednesday. Where about do you, do you move around, or are you stay? No, the we same? we've been eating at Crystals. Okay, we like I like Crystals. It's nice. Yeah. yeah. Well, the wives always come too, and they go to a different group area, and the guys all go to there. <laughs> but Billy Hooper and all those guys sure. come over there. Yeah. And, uh, and the food's good. The food's good. And it's and it's easy parking, and it's a handy location. Right. We meet at eleven fifteen or eleven thirty, so we get a get a table that way for sure. Before the noon crowd gets yeah, in. Yeah, it uh, it is it's kind of heavy, mm -hmm. but uh, I I'm trying to think. Uh, I come over to uh, 
Well, we have meetings over here quite frequently about this 50th anniversary. Right, you, and the book and everything book that's come out, which is the, nice. And there's the, another event coming up soon. Isn't there going to be some sort of a on, dinner? On Wednesday, I mean, on uh, uh, in September. Okay. They have a state meeting here or an association is, meeting. Sure. And as a part of that, they're going to have a celebration okay. for that. Okay. And we have an auction. I keep t turning in these little chairs. Have you ever seen one? Of the, you ought to come with I make these little uh, uh, child rockers, Lincoln little Lincoln rockers, and I cane the bottom and the back and make them out of walnut. And, and, uh, you make them? Yeah, totally. And uh, one of them brought $800 over there the other day, and one of them brought, now these are at the veterinary auctions because sure. the students are all there. And, they probably are bidding up this. Yeah, and, and the money goes to the, sure. to the school. All right. And I have sold one of them to a lady for $400 once, but I have made 16 of those now, and I make a lot of different kinds of furniture. That's wonderful. you got a special kind of hobby. Yeah, it's a nice hobby. Yeah. What about a uh, Purdue tradition? you have a favorite that you'd like to share with us? Anything that comes to mind? Well, I used to enjoy those... Uh, Homecoming uh, parades and and uh, decorations and houses and I remember those. Uh, I thought that was a great tradition. And you got prizes. You got prizes right. and uh, the kids just thoroughly enjoyed it. I think the reason it stopped because the traffic got so heavy that you couldn't drive around the <laughs> west side for a while. <laughs> but that's a good tradition. Uh, the, Dr. Gustafson used to portray the. Dr. Hovde at all the get-togethers, and of course that's gone now, but that was a good tradition. I mm -hmm. thought he was very good at it. <laughs> what about an outstanding event? Do you have a, one that comes to mind? Well, I'm a quite an athlete, athletic supporter, and uh, I remember John Purdue Club. And, good. You uh, still go to the football games? I do. Yeah. I don't go to basketball anymore. It's kind of a cold time of the year. And, uh, and there's a lot of games. And you can see them on TV. Although I do buy my way in once in a while, but I don't buy season. Mm -hmm. I would say that the biggest events were the times we beat uh, Notre Dame, maybe, or Michigan, <laughs> Ohio State. Well, I'm not too anti-IU because my daughter went down there, and I always kind of hope they'd do well, too, you know. Uh, son-in-law, but uh, some of those games with Notre Dame were very exciting. That's right, exactly. And you never know, you cannot predict how it's going to come out. Never could, yeah. never could. They knock Notre Dame off one week and then lose to Toledo the next week. <laughs> <laughs> well, in uh, closing, any co uh, closing comments you'd like to share with us as you look back and look ahead? Well, uh, I can't think of anything that uh, I think the uh, additions to the school have been rather remarkable in terms of physical facilities. I, I feel that uh, sometimes that overwhelms me with sidelights maybe that uh, I feel that the, the old time we taught was pretty good. I'm not sure this computerized medicine is all that or computerized instruction is all that better than than lectures, but uh, you still keep in touch with some of your students. Oh yeah, I run into them a sure. lot. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I do. Okay. We have meetings that. Uh, and you probably see some of them that come maybe to the annual meeting too as well. Oh yeah, there'll be a lot of them there. Sure, especially this year with the big anniversary. Yeah, yeah, and most of all of them now that come to these meetings are our former students, mm -hmm. the uh, older guys of pretty much retired and in fact I played golf just two weeks ago with uh, Russ Harden, he's from Lebanon, and uh, Larry Borst uh, who used to be the state legislature chairman of the budget committee. He, that's a good position to have. <laughs> it certainly is. Yeah, he's uh, not in the legislature anymore. But. No. Uh, we played golf down, down toward Lebanon the other day. I can't think of any. And any. you decided also you decided to stay in Lafayette. 
after yes, I am living alone, and uh, you so any far, have you done any traveling at all? Well, without I go to Florida to my daughter in Orlando uh, every winter for a while. It's not the same without a wife, you know. You don't, there's not much to do by yourself down there. I, I am going on a cruise this went this uh, January with the church group over at the Methodist Church. I don't belong to the church, but I have been pretty active in some of their their activities. I was one of the money counters on Monday morning for a while. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that was fun. Whereabouts is the cruise going to be? Where are you going? It's a, it's a six-day cruise. I believe it will go through, uh, well, it ends up in Jamaica, I think. But it so goes it's down the, in, the in the Caribbean? In the Caribbean, yeah. Well, that will be, it'll be a nice time to go. Yeah. Yeah. Should be nice. Yeah. The if weather I, should be pretty good. Yeah. I I think that I, I told him now if this is a church group, I'm not that churchy. <laughs> 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 I I don't want to give sermons and things. <laughs> don't call or, on me. Or anyone. even prayers. <laughs> right. oh, I want to thank you very much, Doctor Gibbs, well, for this. I really got, enjoyed it. Very.